as I said in my introduction, Tim Robertson is a uh, is an SC, uh, senior New South Wales barrister and civil libertarian with a very broad practice, predominantly in environmental law and public law, including public international law. I've had the opportunity to talk to him tonight. That's just uh, one of his many, many interests. So, Tim, thank you very much, and I would invite you to the microphone. I was introduced to this issue by a friend. It seemed to me that there was a place of enormous natural resources, an arid place, where the land had been stolen from its people, who lived in exile, poverty stricken. I immediately, I immediately said, you mean the pilgrim? <laughs> <laughs> there are, you know, more things that, less things that divide us and bring us together. And there are many similarities between the history of our country and the history of the recent history of the East and the Western Sahara. Tonight, however, I don't want to bore you with uh, legalities and intricate arguments about sovereignty and compliance with international norms. That's for tomorrow. What I want to do is introduce you to the unwritten story of resource exploitation in Africa. And I may so because I'm part of it. For family reasons, I have become the manager of investments which place me in a position of controlling a leading African oil and gas exploration company. And for the same reason, I have a substantial interest in the phosphates of the Western Georgina Basin in the Northern Territory. The corporation which has access to that resource has over one billion tonnes of phosphatic ore. Similar, similar extent to the resources in the Western Sahara. Now, most of you will be aware that in 2002, Hans Carell, a legal advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations, drew a distinction where uh, a, a place was in a form of trusteeship, where the people had not been given the opportunity of expressing their will on their political future and were governed by, or not as the case may be, least control by another country which didn't have or wasn't internationally recognised as the sovereign of that territory. There are certain constraints on what such a country controlling that territory can do. The principal constraint is that it cannot exploit the natural resources of that country for itself. Um, if it does so, it has to hold the proceeds of the exploitation in trust for the people of that place pending the completion of decolonization and the expression, free expression of will by those people as to their future governments. Or a um, stricter interpretation of international law is that no resource exploitation should occur at all, least of all if it depletes the resource. There is a, an old a concept in international law borrowed from the Romans called the usufruct, where you can, if you were in control of a territory, legitimately or not, but where the people had not yet expressed their will, 
you can take the, um, the, the product of the uh, crops um, uh, or uh, fish, uh, basically re restricted to renewable resources. But the kind of resources with which the world is mostly concerned, and the ones that bring in wealth uh, to Africa and other places, are non-renewable and resources which, once extracted, deplete. And the concept of use of fructuary use by the um, dominant power in a non-sovereign territory doesn't extend and has never extended to depletion of those resources. So Mr. Carell drew a distinction between two things exploration where he said the discovery of resources was not um, in breach of international law so the the, so the, the, the the controlling power and in the case of western sahara that's the kingdom of morocco which uh, uh, has has the right at least in a de facto sense it's not directly in breach of international law, even though its exercise of control may be. But it has the right de facto to permit the discovery of resources, but not to permit their exploitation, at least if they are depleting resources, oil, gas, minerals, etc. That regrettably, completely misunderstands the legal and practical relationship between the controlling power and the resource industry. For this reason, when you want to explore for oil or gas, or minerals in some cases, you must first obtain a permit from the government in control of the area you wish to explore. Before those permits are issued, you must enter into what is called a production sharing contract, PSC. Production sharing contracts are very similar the world over. They do similar things, and in Africa, there is not much difference between a production sharing contract in Ghana or Senegal, which is where I operate, and Morocco. Production sharing contracts have two clauses. One which settles the fiscal terms for the life of the project. Most production sharing contracts have a life of 25 years. That is a life that covers not just discovery or exploration, not just appraisal, which occurs before there is a declaration of commerciality of the results, but in production. In other words, the PSC is entered into in Africa and no doubt in Morocco fix the, the fiscal terms of the business for 25 years. Let me give you an example. There's a recent PSC that was released under the SEC rules by Cosmos, which I read. It was a PSC relating to Senegal. And it was 25 years. It related, it included, it went from both exploration to production. And it fixed the tax, the fiscal terms at 25% of net income and excluded value-added taxes, capital gains taxes, rates, rents, and any other form of state taxation. Now, I'm not being critical because the second thing the PSC did was it had a clause about sharing production. In Australia, we are used to our oil and gas enterprises paying a royalty. 
a, an amount to the government to compensate them for the depletion of the mineral resources of the nation that belong to the people. Generally speaking, we expect the payment of a royalty which is calculated on gross revenue, which is a, a fairly uh, easily ascertainable sum, uh, and it means the royalties are that flow into governments in this nation uh, are a, a reasonable return for the exploitation of those resources. That is not so in Africa. In the oil and gas industries, and increasingly in the mineral industries, there is a production sharing clause in lieu of royalty. And the PSCs fix the production share for 25 years. In the case of Cosmos and Senegal, the production share was very favourable to the government. Once the oil company was producing more than a fixed number of barrels a day, the government was getting over 50% of the barrels of oil that the company was producing. So it's not, there's nothing inherently wrong about this. This is where resource nationalism bites in Africa on the production share. But my point is a different one. It's not to evaluate whether this is good or bad from an economic point of view. It's to make the point that the entry into the production sharing agreement fixes the fiscal terms and the return to the people whose resources being depleted for the life of the project. So the way these, these um, legal instruments work is that once you discover oil or gas, you notify your discovery to the government. And then you must put forward within six months a program for appraising the discovery, which involves the drilling of more wells. After appraisal, there is a declaration of commerciality, not as the case may be, but if a declaration of commerciality is made, there is nothing the government can do to stop the project. The oil or gas company has the right to insist on the completion of the project. So the concept that Mr. Carell had in his mind in 2002 simply didn't reflect the facts on the ground because it was at the exploration stage of these projects that the depletion commences because the explorer has the legal control, the right to exploit the resource if a discovery is made and commerciality is declared and to do so on the terms fixed in the contract. So, you can say, if you step back a moment, ask yourself the question, um, if in international law there is an obligation on the power and control of West, the, the government in control of Western Sahara, um, not to permit the exploitation or the depletion of resources without either the agreement of the people um, uh, or the agreement of a representative of, of those people, if that is, the, that is the position, that exploitative decision commences upon the grant of the right to explore, not just to exploit. Because the right to explore in long-term production sharing contracts enables the company doing the exploration work to do the exploitation on the terms fixed by the government of the day, which does not recognise an obligation to consult the people who's, who own the resources or representative of the people. And it may be that the terms of these contracts are advantageous to the people, as the case I, the instance I gave you of the Senegal 
Tom Fraxton with the Cosmos, which had a very favorable production share in favor of the government of the Senate. Um, albeit a low tax rate, but most companies these days don't pay more than 25% anyway um, in tax uh, in, most, in most jurisdictions in the world. But nonetheless, a good, a good deal. It's rather to suggest that at the exploration stage, at the beginning of the mining project, is where the where the exploitation bites. Now, what you must understand about these contracts is that they're not like the kind of contract that you make when you buy a product in this country. If there's a breach of contract, you go to a, you go to a court if you can't sort it out with the other side and the court then rules in accordance with the contract law of this country. That's not what happens in these contracts. These are super contracts. There is no company facing a breach of the contract by the government that will sue in the local courts. They don't sue in the local courts because every Every major enterprise in Africa that is a foreign investor is protected by investment protection agreements or treaties. They sue in a tribunal called ICSI, headquartered in New York, pursuant to what is called the New York Convention for the Protection of Investments. ICSI comprises an arbitrator, and two other arbitrators appointed by the parties to the dispute, um, who usually agree with the chair, the chair, or chairperson of the tribunal, conducted largely in secret, although increasingly they are publishing their determinations. Once a determination or judgment is made by this tribunal about the breach of contract, it is registrable in most of the courts of the world as a local judgment. Let me tell you what happened in Tanzania. Tanzania has been struggling with power, uh, with energy, and with water supplies. And so it entered into one of these agreements with an American firm to supply water um, and another one to supply energy. And the firms made significant investments in Tanzania. Now, Tanzania's system for electricity distribution is, if you don't mind me saying so, stuck. There are probably about 9% of the population gets a regular supply of electricity. Regular means maybe um, once every three days on average. In Tanzania, because the, the electricity authority failed to pay the rent on the equipment supplied under these contracts, the American company sued Tanzania in an exit tribunal and obtained a judgment for 30 million US dollars. The first thing it did was register the judgment in London, where Tanzania had some assets and it seized those assets. Then, because it didn't like the government at all, at least with all the electricity program, it registered the judgment in Tanzania. And they sought to, the electricity people sought to set it aside and failed, which is a good thing because it shows the courts are actually working. But it registered it in Tanzania, and the first thing these people did was seize the Mercedes belonging to the CEO of the electricity company. But these super contracts are protected by a supernational system of law that few people know about, but which is extremely powerful. And there it, it operates as an enormous disincentive on the government, even if it makes a bad deal, if it entered into a poor 
fiscal arrangement with, 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 with a foreign investor, it imposes enormous pressure on the government not to breach the contract because of the availability of supranational remedies that can be exercised against that government anywhere in the world. And of course the fact that the Exit Tribunal, generally speaking, are independent of the parties and of the government. Another reason, of course, why foreign investors don't want to litigate in the home jurisdictions, because except for the example I gave you in Tanzania, usually the courts will back for the home team. And sometimes, regrettably, the judges are not uh, beyond uh, being influenced by government parties involved in litigation. If you have confidence in the rule of law, you sue locally, but that confidence is not widespread in Africa. So, you have to, when, when conceptualising this issue, you have to be aware that these contracts, these production sharing agreements, are incredibly powerful. You can't think that maybe you'll become a government one day in five or six years' time, and in a bout of resource nationalism, you want to rewrite all these agreements. It ain't on, and it isn't going to happen, and it's a fantasy. Don't even think about it. India at the moment has had a long-running dispute with a company that has actually just stopped drilling off Western Sahara called Can Energy, a Scottish oil and gas company. Um, uh, in fact, one of the best of the, of the medium-sized independents when it comes to skills, um, but not, uh, I think, politics. But nonetheless, uh, a very highly regarded company that opened up a huge oil field in India. And then it's heavily, well, but it was more like Burma oil, but you know, for, for years and years, no one had found oil in India until Can came along and found it. Um, and Can then did what all companies do, it farmed out, or farmed down its interests um, to about 10%. Um, and the capital gain that it obtained, which wasn't taxable at the time in India, the Indian government then imposed a retrospective capital gains tax and sought to take 700 million pounds from Can as the tax on farming out or farming down its Indian interest. In fact, what it did was it, it localised those interests by listing a, a subsidiary on the Indian Stock Exchange, and so Indians could participate in this in the exploitation of their own oil. It, in, a, in, a, in a sense, it did the right thing, but it took its bundle of money um, and left the jurisdiction, uh, but now, the government won't let it sell its shares in the local company until it pays this huge amount of taxation. But that's a case, that's, that's, that's an unusual case where um, a very large country decides to take on an, an oil company. But I tell you, the diplomatic problems India has had, every time Indians speak to the, speak to the British government, which they do frequently, of course, they've got all sorts of historic and current interests together. This problem is raised, and the, 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 the current Indian government is, is uh, setting out to solve it, and it may well solve it to the benefit of Japan. But this is why setting the fiscal terms of the project is so important in the production sharing agreement. If you can, if you know that over the 25 years of the project you will be paying X dollars tax. That then enables you to go and borrow. Why do you need to borrow? <coughs> the banks won't lend you unless the fiscal terms are fixed. Why do you need to borrow? Because the cost of oil and gas drilling is beyond most people's comprehension. The oil and gas industry is the most technologically sophisticated in the world. They still have, they still make mistakes and have accidents. We know about the Gulf of Mexico, we know about the Exxon Valdez, etc. But when you think about all the wells in the world, they are really few and far between, generally speaking, 
it's a very safe industry, but it's one which uses the best brains in the world to do its work for it. Last year, when we drilled in Senegal, the cost of one well, one, one discovery well, was 120 million US dollars. One oil well. The cost of the drill ship was 660,000 US dollars a day, and that's what we paid them. It cost us another 600,000 US dollars a day to hire three ships that are needed, uh, plus all the equipment, plus all the intellectual effort of the geologists, geophysicists, uh, and, and the workers, and so on and so forth. Altogether, the cost of drilling one well was 1.2 million US dollars a day. Now, that has halved this year. As the price of oil has halved, so have these costs. So it's going to cost half that. And that means that in Senegal, we'll be drilling six wells this year, instead of three, appraising the discoveries that we made on the carbonate platform and in the fan system of Senegal. And those discoveries are very important for Western Sahara. Very important. Because no one has discovered commercial oil or at least not since the Mauritania discovery years and years ago. But no one's discovered commercial oil on the North Atlantic transform margin. Apart from me. <laughs> We've got two commercial wells in Senegal, and we have billions of barrels of oil. We have discovered a gigantic elephantine oil field. Now, the, the, the you have you, it, oil is actually it's really simple. You look if you stand in Africa and you look across the Atlantic Ocean, if you look at South America, if you stand in Western Sahara and look across the Atlantic Ocean, you look at Baltimore. Why do you look at Baltimore? Because 200 million years ago, the Western Sahara and Baltimore were two peas in the same geological pot. They were about 20 kilometers apart. 20 kilometers apart. If you go down to Ghana, you're looking over at Venezuela. A couple of American scientists 15 years ago took, uh, and oil, because it's a natural thing, it has a signature. And they took the signature of the oils in Ghana and they took the signature of the oils in South America and they matched them precisely. The oils, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away, were from the same source. Before the tectonic plates shifted and the Atlantic Ocean was created. The oil is from the burial of vegetation and some small animals that inhabit the seas and the ponds and the wetlands. Um, we think of that after enormous magmatic activity, volcanic activity, or earthquakes become buried. And in Western Sahara, the degree of burial is eight kilometers. There's eight kilometers of buried material since 200 million years ago in Western Sahara. And of Senegal, we have discovered a series of hills, just like that, called the Berry Hills, which was the landscape of Senegal, 200 million years of Cretaceous period landscape. And in that Cretaceous period, that was just after oil started to be cooked in the kitchens, both of South America, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Western Atlantic was known as the margin uh, because of the platform off the Western Atlantic where, which was once part of the land in which dinosaurs roamed um, and um, vegetation became uh, capable of, of being cooked in these kitchens and creating oil and gas of course. So you're able to know, this is why oil is simple, if you know what oil is being found in Baltimore, 
you know what oil is going to be found in Western Sahara. However, there's a trick. Oil has to be held by stratigraphic um, traps or cages, if you like. And those, those traps have to be sealed, usually by a, by a rock um, that's laid out on top of um, a porous material like limestone or plastics, sandy material, sandstones, in which the oil resides in the pores. Um, sits there. And, however, because the oil will be buoyant, if water gets below it, pushes the oil up, creates a pressure. And if, if, if there is a fault, if there's a volcanic uh, activity, earthquake, faults created, sometimes the faults close the traps and trap the oil. Sometimes they open the traps and the oil then seeps um, because of the principles of buoyancy and we're back to Newtonian classical physics here, uh, seeps to the surface, which of course may be 2,000 metres under the Atlantic Ocean. When we drilled in Senegal, it was 1,600 metres of ocean we drilled in, and then we drilled another six kilometres below the, the, below the bed of the ocean to obtain the oils. And what we drilled into was a system of fans. Think back to the dinosaur days. You have a green and verdant land. It's very high temperatures, but, but it has some degree of temperate uh, climate, a lot of carbon around in the atmosphere, a lot of green growth. There's a, uh, there are volcanoes, uh, there are earthquakes, and there is, there is snow in Africa. And the snow melts and it, like in Bangladesh today, it brings a whole lot of sandy material down through the river systems into a delta formation off the coast. That creates what's called a fan. And what the oil and gas explorers are searching for on the West African margin are fans, stacked fans. Because over the period of between 200 million years ago and 100 million years ago, Ago, these fans, these river deltas, periodically were filled in by hard rocks, and then there was more sand, and then more hard rocks, each of them a fan system. In Senegal, we found 10 deltas stacked one on top of the other, each of them bearing some oil. And that's what they are drilling for in a, in a month's time off Morocco, an Australian company called PDD, with other companies, I think Cosmos, are drilling a fan system in the hope of striking, finding an elephant, a huge area of oil in those fans. But, and here is the problem. In Morocco and Western Sahara, in the last 10 years, there have been 21 oil wells drilled and none of them have been commercial. Almost every well has found some oil, which suggests that there is a working petroleum system, a kitchen lying underneath there, probably all the way to Baltimore, cooking the oil. But there were no the traps weren't, weren't properly formed. The oil was too young or too old, or the traps weren't sealed and the oil had escaped. For whatever reason, somehow or other, every one of those drills failed. Failed in the sense that although they discovered oil, the oil was not commercial. Now what that means is you have to be able to you have to find a deposit of oil, and this just get out of your mind the idea of oil sitting in a lake, it doesn't. It sits in rocks systems. There's no such thing as a lake of oil uh, under the ground. Um, but but the, you have to find at least 200 million to 300 million barrels of oil because the cost of lifting that oil to the surface and then removing the gas from it and then pumping it into tankers uh, is in the billions in capital expenditure. I mean, we are talking about 
Um, if you look at the, at, at the money that they had spent in the Jubilee fields, which are at the moment the biggest of uh, West Africa, I think the, cap, the cap, capex of Jubilee was three to four billion dollars. Because under the floating platform, the drill, uh, you, were, you have maybe six or seven holes in your field. And say so you've got you've got pipe, you've got floating pipes going to each of those holes, and on the bottom of the sea, you have pumps. And those pumps have to be powered. And this is a really sophisticated operation, and it costs a lot of dough. A bit less now that the oil price has gone down, but a lot of dough. There is no African country that is capable, that has anything like the kind of money that would be needed to exploit it. That's why you've got to have foreign investors. But to go back to where I started from, the price of the investment is the capacity to borrow those funds from the capital markets of the world and the capital markets will not lend you unless you can show them a security. And the security you show them is the production sharing contract. They won't lend without one, and they won't lend unless the production sharing contract fixes the fiscal terms for the life of the loan. Because no one's going to lend you if a, 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 a country wishing to exercise its resource nationalism or because of a local movement wants to take back its oil, suddenly imposes additional taxes, suddenly imposes higher production shares, and that completely upsets the equations in which the lending authorities have lent you the money to undertake these exercises. There's one exception to this, and that's the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, at a time when people were worried about pink oil, went around the world and drilled. It didn't charge anyone for doing so, the American government paid it, in order to discover what resources were left in the world. What oil resources were left in the world. And they found, and, and, this, and this destroyed the pink oil hypothesis, because they found enormous amounts of oil offshore, um, and of course, uh, onshore as well, but principally offshore, in places like Africa where, where there, had, there had been some finds but they were few and far between and none of them were commercial at that stage. The US government went around the world and it poured billions of dollars into this drill program and it produced wonderful papers that basically tell the industry and the government where oil is to be found. The latest paper that I have from the USGS about Morocco and Western Sahara tells us that in the uh, offshore salt structures, which is um, sort of drillers' terminology for one particular kind of um, structure under which oil is often found, uh, there should be uh, a mean number 7.5 billion barrels of oil. And that's the most, that is the highest amount, the greatest amount of oil anywhere in North Africa, other than the onshore fields, the working fields in Libya, um, that the USGS has, has uh, predicted would be present. Despite that prediction, and 21 dr drill pits, no commercial oil has been discovered. That um, suggests that the prospects for success in the future may not be as great as people have predicted, which is a pity in a way. Um, although oil has been very destructive in places like Nigeria um, and, in some, and Sierra Leone and some other African countries, uh, but it has been a boom in other countries that have, that have approached the industry um, in a much smarter way uh, than some of the peers. Now, um, I wanted to say in and although um, not all of you have food, uh, because what I had to say tonight wasn't particularly palatable. Um, the, uh, uh, but but the, what, what I, the, the point I want to uh, want impress upon you is that this concept of 
division between exploration and production is, is mythology. It's not how the industry works. It isn't how the mines work. No one goes and spends this, this sort of money on exploration unless they have a roll goal guarantee from the government, which is enforceable in the exit tribunals, um, that if oil is found in this commercial, that they can then proceed to exploit it. So the, the problem, the, the Western Sahara problem of the exploitation, the exploitation of natural resources doesn't start with production, it starts with discovery. Now, I don't want to depress all of you. Um, the fact that in 21 wells, oil, has, oil shows have been found means that there is a working petroleum system there somewhere. And sooner or later, someone is going to find a trap, which is a seal, where oil sits. And the kind of porosities that we're finding on North Africa are much higher than the porosities that we are finding on shore in many other places. We're getting porosities of up to 25%, which is kind of huge. Um, and although sometimes it's 5 or 10%, which is sort of average, uh, the porosities of North Africa can be very high, which means it's extremely high quality sands uh, from which um, oil exploitation is successful. It's much cheaper than having to pump a lot of gas into, into the wells. But even if there is no oil off Western Sahara, which is commercial, Western Sahara has in common with all the other North African countries a remarkable resource, limestone. Four or five kilometres under the sea there is a huge carbonate platform. I want to leave you with this thought. In everyone's kitchen in this country, there's one thing, bicarbonate soda. And how is that bicarbonate soda made? CO2 plus limestone. In other words, it may well be that North Africa has the capacity to save the world from climate change. It has so much limestone. Off Western Sahara, the limestone is six kilometres deep, hundreds of kilometres wide. That it has the capacity to sink the next 10 years of emissions from the United States alone of CO2. And if that can be done together with drilling, using the same holes, but just going deeper into the limestone platform, it can be done efficiently, cost-efficiently, in a way which doesn't stymie the production of oil, which of course is used for many other things than combustion. 17% of oil is used in transformation, which doesn't release CO2. Oil is one of the most flexible and important products in the world. Um, as well as solving global warming problems of the world. Now that may be worth a lot more to Western Sahara as a sea fiddle, not a landfill, but a sea fiddle, than indeed the much mythologised um, oil wealth of the offshore 